webinar migrant women and the Nordic labor market challenges and opportunities. This webinar is a collaboration between the Nordic Welfare Center, an institution in the Nordic Council of Ministers, Social and Health Sector, and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment in Finland. My name is uh, Jens Bari, and I have the big honor to serve as your moderator here today. I'm sitting in uh, Finland, in the Helsinki region, and as you know, this was meant to be a seminar held in Helsinki today, but due to the coronavirus, we will carry it out as a webinar. And I'm so happy, so happy to see participants joining from a lot of different countries. We are now 150 soon taking part to, to this webinar, and it's, uh, it's great to see you. I can only say, wow. Ja tervetuloa myös suomeksi. Mä muistutan vaan, että tämä webinaarihan pidetään englannin kielellä, mutta jos te haluatte, niin saatte myös esittää kysymyksiä chatissa suomeksi ja me käännetään sitten nämä kysymykset englanniksi ennen kuin mä esitän ne puhujille. Välkomna bara kort också på skandinaaviska ja påminna om att det här seminariet ju är på engelska, men ni får jättegärna också kommentera, ni får skriva, ni får kommentera och ställa frågor på skandinaviska också. Vi översätter frågorna till föreläsarna sen när det blir tid för det om cirka en timme. So before we start, I would like just to remind you of a couple of, uh, of things. First of all, you can see the, the chat and I can already see that you are writing and commenting uh, in it, on it. It makes me really, really happy. Share your thoughts and share your best practices and experience of today's topic in the, in the chat. You can also write questions to the speakers and we will take your questions after the official part of this webinar. And that means in about uh, one hour. You can see Helena Lagerkrantz there on the, on the screen. She's one of the members of the organizing committee here. She will take care of the chat, helping me with the questions to the, to the presenters later on then. And as I mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and published on YouTube, so you can get the, the link after this webinar to share it with friends and to share it with uh, colleagues. And uh, this rec recorded part, this official part of uh, this webinar will last for one hour-ish. And after that, we will continue, continue for about 15, 20 minutes something with Q's and A's. So you can choose to stay with us for uh, the discussion and the questions also, but the official part will be over uh, in uh, one hour. So I think... Uh, Enough has been said about practical uh, issues. Let's start today's topic. The key aim of this webinar is to promote exchange of experience between the Nordic countries. And the main questions are which policies and interventions would improve the employment rate for immigrant women who arrive in the Nordic region? And what are, what are the best practices to integrate female immigrants in the labor market? We will today share some of the best examples from the Nordic countries. We will hear of projects, uh, projects and measurements that successfully improve the integration of, of uh, migrant women in the labor market. So that's what we're going to do today. And first, I will virtually hand over the microphone and the screen to one of the organizers, Christine Marklund. Christine is a senior advisor from the Nordic Welfare Center in Sweden. And Christine will now talk about the Nordic cooperation on integration. Please, Christine, go ahead. Thank you, Jens. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project Nordic Cooperation on Integration. And I work together with, with Elena Lagerkrans that you see. Um, and uh, this is a project that started in the end of 2016, and we're also called the Clearing Central. And it's initiated by the Nordic Council of Ministers, and uh, the purpose is to facilitate cooperation 
between the Nordic countries on integration of refugees and immigrants and to encourage the countries to work more closely together and to share experiences. And all the results of the project can, uh, such as compiled research, best practice in the Nordic, seminars, webinars like this one and news can be seen in the, at, at the website and you see the address there. And I work at the Nordic Welfare Center, one of the institute, institutions under the Nordic Council of Ministers. And we are situated here in Stockholm and also in Helsinki. In this project we have a cooperation with um, our sister organis organization Nord Regio, which is a research organization <coughs> also here in Stockholm. Uh, the webinar was planned to be a conference in Helsinki today, um, arranged in cooperation with the Finnish Minister of um, Economic Affairs and Employment and the Center for of Expertise uh, in Immigrant Integration. Due to the COVID-19 situation, we now arrange this webinar instead. And I know that there will be another webinar after the summer in finished and arranged by the Finnish Minister. So we don't have the date yet for that seminar. And uh, the main focus in the project <coughs> is labor market inclusion and every year we add new themes. So we have been uh, working with uh, focusing women's participation on the labor market. We have had a theme on migration to municipalities struggling with declining and aging population. And we also have worked with how to combat segregation and increase social sustainability. Uh, early interventions to immigrant children and families is a theme and also civil society in partnership with municipalities. And uh, we have also have a theme about unaccompanied minors and a new theme this year will be negative social control. In 2019, the Nordic Council of Ministers they published three reports that I want to highlight here. And the first one, integrating immigrants into the Nordic labor market was made by 14 distinguished Nordic researchers under the lead of uh, Professor Lars Kantfors. And it's a knowledge review regarding what works within labor market integration of immigrants. And on the website, you can find eight policy briefs that summarize themes in the report. They are very short, one or two slides that summarize this, this research. For example, the role of ins social insurance, education policy, and how to, how to promote higher employment for immigrant women. The second guide there in the middle is a Danish guide that summarizes uh, knowledge on women's participation on the labor market. And it's a guide how you can work with this topic. And then we have Nordic Integration and Settlement Policies for Refugees. It's a register-based study following more than 200,000 refugees uh, in Norway, Sweden and Denmark. Finland is unfortunately not in this, in this research. And it's during eight years after the, the integration program. And these reports give a good overview how to integrate immigrants into the Nordic labor market and make comparisons between the Nordic countries. Here you can see our latest and our upcoming reports. A couple of weeks ago, we published mental health and well-being of unaccompanied unaccompanied minors, a Nordic overview. And you can also find a new report on early interventions for children and parents, the second one there, 
Det finns för idrätts alkohol, tidiga insatser till barn, unga och föräldrar. It came uh, in the middle of, uh, no, in the beginning of this year, in January, I think. And here you can find examples from all the Nordic countries of early intervention. And the third one there is a short version of the report I showed you earlier, Nordic Integration and Settlement Policy for Refugees. And it takes about 17 minutes to read this report. So I, I, um, I recommend you to, uh, to spend 17 minutes on this because I think it's really interesting. And uh, so we published this short version last week. And we also have an upcoming report, Learning to Live in a New Country. Uh, it's about the civil society and how they contribute to integration in partnership with municipalities in the Nordics. Um, at last I want to say something about the results in the report Nordic Integration and Settlement Policies for Refugees, the one that you could read for in 17 minutes. So I will now tell you the short ver version in 17 seconds, I think. And um, who is best after Denmark, Norway and Sweden at integrating refugees into the labor market after the integration program? So if you see in Denmark, uh, men's participation on the labor market is fastest. And in Norway, the they are the best of the two until four years and are continuing to have the lead in the Nordic countries. Sweden passes Denmark after eight years and is a long-term winner if you compare to Denmark. Norway is a clear winner when it comes to integration of female refugees. But my point is that during 2015, Sweden received 163,000 asylum seekers, much more than the other Nordic countries. And Sweden is the country that still have a flow of refugees coming. This means that the challenges are probably uh, greater in Sweden than in the other Nordic countries. Um, so I hope that this presentation will inspire you to um, take part in integration efforts in the other Nordic countries. And I, re I recommend you to take a few minutes looking at the website. And th what you see here is, is the QR code. And you can use your um, camera on the mo mobile phone. You can take it just mm -hmm. now and do like this. And go directly to the website and there you can find all the publications that I have been talking about. Okay, over to Jens, I think. Perfect, Christine. Thank you. And I don't think I have to remind you of the chat. I can see a lot of questions coming in, a lot of comments coming coming in. That makes me really, really happy. And I think uh, we'll take the questions uh, to Christine after the official part, which means in, uh, in 45 minutes about. Because now we'll move along to the next presenter, to the next uh, speaker. Maria Hemström Hemmingsson is uh, Director General and Head of Institutet för Arbetsmarknads- och Utbildningspolitisk Utvärdering in Sweden. And Maria is now going to talk about labor market integration of non-Western women. What works and what doesn't work? Please, Maria, the screen is yours. Thank you, Jens. When I was first asked to talk about this subject at another conference almost a year ago, I didn't hesitate. Such an important topic. And I was sure that there would be a huge amount of research uh, to refer to. But there isn't. Research based on registered data from which conclusions can be, can be drawn on the effect 
of different interventions for different subgroups of immigrants, in particular non-Western immigrant, immigrated women, such research is very scarce. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, first, let me show you uh, a graph uh, presenting approved residence permits in Sweden during the last decade. There has, uh, as shown, been an increasing number of asylum seekers. And as Christine mentioned, no, she didn't say exactly that. She said it was 163,000 asylum seekers a few years ago. But the number of accepted refugees per citizen has been larger in Sweden than in any other European country. Today, the share of non-Western uh, immigrants in the working age population in our respective countries amounts to 3% in Finland and Iceland, 5% in Denmark, 6% in Norway, and 8% in Sweden. Um, if we look at what we know about the situation of foreign-born in the Swedish labor market, and remember that this is similar for the other Nordic countries, the first obvious thing is that it takes time for refugees and their families to establish themselves in the labor market. Uh, the employment rate among refugees who came to Sweden at the turn of the century were 25 percent lower 12 years after entry than among people of the same age and sex who were born in Sweden. 25 percent is a lot. However, the time needed in order to integrate into the labor market varies largely between different subgroups of immigrants. It depends, of course, on the course of migration. It depends on their education and health. There are subgroups with very low education and very bad health who suffers both trauma and depression due to previous experiences. There is also differences in country-specific capital, such as understanding and accepting existing social norms. Also, we know that some groups are more exposed to discrimination than others. And these difficulties faced by immigrants uh, are mirrored in high unemployment and a low labor force participation and a low employment rate. And if we look at, again, Swedish data, unemployment in 2018, you see here the share of employment, unemployment among natives and foreign borns. Uh, at that time, unemployment among people born in Sweden amounted to between um, 3-4%, but among immigrants, 15%. And again, there are huge differences between different subgroups of immigrants. And we find here, let me see if I can get it, um, employment, unemployment rates among different um, immigrants, depending on their country of origin. And you see how high it is among immigrants from Asia and Africa. Um, next, if we look at the share of employed in the working age population, giving the number of years since entry into Sweden, uh, the green line describes uh, employment rates among men, the red among women, and the yellow, the average. Um, and basically what this shows us is that 16 years after entry to Sweden, employment rates among immigrants amount to approximately two-thirds. So one-third um, do not work uh, at all. And lastly, what we know about the situation is that it's particularly difficult for immigrant women who are born outside Europe. That is the, the group that we focus on at this seminar. I said in the beginning that little is known from research about what works and what doesn't for this group. And Christine mentioned one of the few exceptions, and that is an excellent study published by the Nordic Council of Ministers in 2019. And the name of the publication is Integrating Immigrants into the Nordic Labor Markets. It's uh, edited by Lars Kahn and Nora Sanchez-Gassen. One chapter there. Uh, 
was written by Jakob Nielsen Arendt and Marie Louise Schulz Nielsen, looked specifically at the employment effects of welfare policies for non Western immigrant women. And that chapter is highly recommended. From there, we can draw conclusions on policies for non Western immigrant women. Um, and based on this, we know that there are many different and complex explanations for the low employment rate among non-Western women. Many of them have low, some no education. Language skills are limited. Health problems are larger among foreign-born than native Swedes, but they tend to be even larger among foreign-born women than foreign-born men. Many uh, non-Western women who come to Sweden are in, at, in childbearing ages. Also, research from all over the world shows show us that the outcome, labor market outcome, tend to be heavily influenced by values and employment rates in the country of origin. So, and the fact we see this all over the Nordic countries that there are large differences in female employment rates depending on where they come from. Uh, women who were born in Vietnam and Iran have employment rates at approximately 60%. Uh, women from Turkey, 40, 40 to 50%. Women from Pakistan, Iran and Somalia, less than 40%. And needless to say, it's a huge challenge to adapt to the Nordic way of life for women who were brought up in countries with an entirely different view on, for example, gender equality. The authors of this chapter, they distinguish five alternative policies in order to increase the labor force participation and employment among non-Western female immigrants. It's family policies, introduction program for newly arrived immigrants, active labor market policies, social benefit policies, and education policies. And if we look at this in turn and start with family policies, that includes child care and parental leave schemes. And we look at the large amount of international evidence. We know and they also conclude that norms in the country of origin influences outcomes in the host country. We know also that a more generous parental leave scheme increases the risk for negative effects in terms of employment and outcome among women, particularly women with no or less education. So if it's economically possible to stay at home with one's children, women tend to do so. Uh, there are, in this case, five uh, studies who look specifically at Nordic countries, and they find that benefits paid to women uh, if they take care of their own children at home, that decreases their employment and their labor force participation. There is one study only that looks at the cost of childcare. It's a Swedish study. And the hypothesis was that if childcare is less expensive, it would have a positive effect on employment, also for immigrated women. However, the, the results show that this effect is indeed a fact for women born in Sweden. They increase their employment if child costs decreases, but no similar effect is found for immigrant, immigrated women. Secondly, if we look at the introduction programs for newly arrived immigrants, such programs exist in all Nordic countries. There are nine different Nordic studies who look at these, and overall, the uh, results are, in most cases, very disappointing. There are no or, um, at best, very limited effects on employment. In some cases, it's even negative. That means that immigrants who participated in such programs are less likely to be employed at a later point in time. And this is the fact both in Sweden and in the Nordic countries. But in Sweden only up until 2010, the, uh, the Swedish introduction program that was released in 2000, 
2010 transferred the responsibility from the municipalities to the public employment service and that strengthened the employment focus and this reform seemed to have increased transition into employment. Uh, but overall here, so yeah, there are the exceptions, sorry, <laughs> was a bit too soon there. Um, and from this program then we have limited employment but larger income effects that are positive and larger positive effects for childless women with higher education. If instead we look at, I went the wrong way here, if instead we look at active labour market policies which build on a strong Nordic tradition, um, this includes job search assistance, labour market training and subsidised employment and they include in fact both support and help and control that the unemployments are unemployed are in fact available for work if they are offered a job. The four existing studies um, look specifically at the effect of such policies for non-Western immigrant women and they find positive employment effects. In particular, they find that subsidized employment has the largest effect. And that is in line with findings from the general research literature on such policies. However, effects have been found to be smaller for immigrated women than immigrated men. Fourth, social benefit policies include um, different changes in benefits and sanctions associated with these benefits. Uh, in this case, international evidence shows that generous benefits with no requirements for counterperformance may create poverty traps. That is, situations in which it doesn't pay to take up paid work. In this case, we look at six different Nordic studies, uh, mostly from Denmark, five out of six, the sixth from Norway. Three Danish uh, studies look at the effect when the levels of social assistance was de decreased and they find that lower levels of benefits increased employment, in particular among women with previous labour market record, that is women who had been working at some point in time, either in Denmark or in their native country, were more likely to be employed when social assistance were cut. Uh, next, the Norwegian study looked at increased access to, dis to disability benefits and found that for those who had the possibility to, to get such benefits, employment decreased. Finally, a Danish study looked at sanctions in uh, unemployment benefits and concluded that increased, an increased number and likelihood of sanctions shortened the unemployment spell and increased self-sufficiency. Let's see here if I can change slide. Finally, regular education. We know that many immigrant women, in particular from non-Western countries, have low only elementary schooling and they have an even lower labor force participation and higher unemployment than other immigrants. And their situation is aggravated by the fact that there is a relatively low share of uh, low-skilled jobs in the Nordic labour market. In this case, studies concerning the effect of higher education show, which is very positive, large, long-lasting effects in terms of employment and income, and these effects are larger for women than for men. Uh, we have a few challenges here, um, and let's just forget that it may be expensive and look specifically at this group. Here we find in the Swedish case that the fact that the introduction program amounts to two years at a maximum means that 
it's difficult to finish a proper education for those who have none in that time. Also, we know that temporary residence permits tend to, to provide less incentives for longer education. Uh, I'll start with three questions, three concluding questions uh, to all of you who have a lot of knowledge in this area. Uh, and I do this based on the research that show that this is important. How can we increase the likelihood of a holistic perspective in the support of and relevant educational interventions aimed at non-Western immigrant women? Because this appears to have the largest effect. Secondly, how can we secure that many women have access to equal support and possibilities within available interventions programs? There is a large amount of research that indicates that this is not the case today. Finally, what are the incentives for taking up paid work versus staying at home with one's children? And with that, I stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Jan, back to you. Uh, yep, thank you. Maria, very, very interesting points you have. And uh, thank you all participants for all the questions you are writing in the in the chat. I don't need to, to remind you to, to use it any longer. Of course, I mean, use it, ask more questions, but you have already figured out how to, to do it. Now, I'm not uh, sure whether um, we should continue with uh, B. Puranen or with uh, Alexandra Riederstad because oh, yes, I can see B here on my. I'm here. Screen. I just put yes, it off while can. while looking at. You... Hmm? Perfect, perfect, perfect. B. Then we'll stick to the original schedule we we have because the next speaker is B. Puranen and she is the Secretary General from the World Values Survey, and that is the Institute for Futures Studies. And the title B has chosen today is uh, Migrant Hygge, Feeling at Home in a Cold Climate. Uh, B, the virtual stage. Thank you. Yours. Thank you all. What you can see on this first slide is some of the people that we have interviewed. So the difference between um, what we talked about just previously with the statistics, these are interviews made with the people, 6,500 something. So I will uh, go to, to the presentation of that, which is a part of the World Value Survey. World Value Survey has done face-to-face uh, -face interviews with people for almost 40 years. We started 1981, and we've done it in more than 100 countries. That means we have interviews done in the countries from where the uh, non-European migrants comes to Europe, so we will compare the values with the country of origin, with the values that exist in our countries, and then we have looked at how do people um, transiting from country of origin to country of destination change their values, what happens over time, and since we have 40 years time scale, we can also see the transition. Uh, this map you can find all over the world, a lot of people use it. It's uh, you can uh, if you go up, uh, in, you you can enlarge it um, so you can see better. I will enlarge it here. Um, it's made each fifth years from these countries. Imagine going from a country down uh, in in the gray area, for example, which Maria just mentioned, the difficulties coming from African Islamic countries up to the Protestant Europe, where you have the Nordic countries. That, of course, is a very challenging situation. Now we'll see if I can go back to the smaller area. Can you help me to go to, to making it smaller? Yes, here I have it. So, uh, so imagine that, uh, and this is the, the question we have, we have had in mind, and um, uh, the title of this presentation, um, Feeling at Home in a Cold Climate, is a result that really surprised us, that we had such a high level of feeling at home in Sweden. We haven't still made uh, migrant world value surveys in the other Nordic countries, but we are planning to do, and uh, we do hope. And the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers has given us a 
preparation, um, some funding for, for making sure how to do that in, the, in all Nordic countries. What you can see here, if you look at the blue and the orange, that's people who have responded uh, positively on, staying at, uh, on, on uh, feeling at home in Sweden. And that goes very much, uh, the results is very interesting when you compare it with what Maria was talking about. And we will uh, do a, a short comparison because we got some really <laughs> surprising results. For example, we know that education always helps when it comes to changing values because you are used to, to studying and, and, and all these things. And then we got this very surprising results that the people with almost no schooling, especially coming from Somalia, Eritrea, etc., and Afghanistan, they were much more feeling at home and re responded much more positive to coming to Sweden. And we couldn't understand how come that we have these results. So we really did the analysis back and forth several times. And we have done all these interviews. And we had the same puzzling result when it came to ages. Because young people, we know with the socialization hypothesis that it's easier to change um, your views when you when you transit and when you're young, while elderly people are supposed to be have more difficulties. And we found the opposite. We found that the elderly were the ones who were most feeling at home. So they changed their mindset, obviously, um, uh, more than the young ones. We couldn't understand this either. Uh, and then when we came to sex differences, <clears throat> we know that the Nordic countries, and especially Sweden, is um, the emancipation gray, uh, level is very high. So we, we thought maybe the women coming here would really be the one benefiting from, from the coming to an emancipated society. And then we see that there is there's very small differences between men and women. Actually, the men are even a bit uh, higher than the, the, the women. So we couldn't understand how, how could we have these results. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, that was my phone. Um, so uh, our explanation now, when we have looked at this, is that uh, education. When you are highly educated in your country of origin, you are someone. When you came to Sweden, it didn't help. We didn't accept the, the, the education that most people had, so they feel, felt disappointed a change of their status. When it came to, to the um, age structure, you also have the very same thing with, uh, with, uh, with the younger people comparing themselves with other young people and seeing that they are not in the same position as other young people, while the elderly much more compare themselves with the situation at home. If you come from a country with, um, where you have much lower level, not only of education, but also on life expectancy, if you have a life expectancy of 50-something, like you have in Somalia, and then you compare it with elderly people living decades after decade longer here, they felt that they really benefited from coming to Sweden. Uh, so that was the explanation. And finally, when it came to, to women, well, they still had the same workload with the homework like they had in the country of origin. And then added on to that came that they were supposed to learn a new language and to, 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 to go into education, etc. So they felt they got a much heavier uh, workload on them. And that's why, they, uh, why, why we, in our conclusions, found out that it made sense from them for, from a logical point of view to, to, to react the way they did. And these reactions are problematic when you would like women to enter the labor market. And I do agree with the f findings that Maria just talked about. And we can see the very same thing when we see the, the, the in the face-to-face -face interviews. We have a measure, Emancipative Values Index, that uh, is composed by four sub-indices. One is um, um, taking uh, studying uh, the the autonomy and autonomy that is uh, for uh, what what do you what do we want for children what are our beliefs for the children and equality of course the women's possibility for the labor market for possibility for education for for starting their own companies etc and choice to make your own choices whom to marry if to marry uh, having children um, wanting to 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 divorce um, abortion, homosexuality, all this stuff, and then voice, that's the democratic uh, part of it, making your voice heard. And here comes, um, now you need to, to, to enlarge again your, your, your view so you can see it better. 
So if we start then, if we managed, uh, we measured all this, we put all the questions, a lot of questions, into factor scores, and then the factor scores are into exactly the same way as we've done the the math for for the global, the one that I showed you, that the colorful one, colorful one. The difference with this one is that we added on the migrants because in most surveys you do not have migrants. They never, they are not included because they don't know the language and and they do, they have a very low response rate. That's why we have done this migrant world value survey because it doesn't exist any uh, surveys like this uh, where you do keep the methodology and you can compare with from country of origin to country of destination. So what do you see here? Well, when it comes to the x-axis, the one you see in the middle, uh, it goes from to the left you have a low level of equality and then you have a high level of equality on the right side. And um, if you look at the blue spots you can see down below on the left side, these are the country of origin. I take out three where we have beautiful time series. That's Turkey, Iraq, and Iran. And then we look at, at the right side. You can see all the seven most common non-European migrant groups that we have in the Nordic countries. And especially this is, this is Sweden. And you can see also where you have Sweden, but you can see Norway, you can see Denmark. Uh, uh, and Finland, of course, and the Iceland uh, is, is up there. All are in the same area, so to speak. What you can see here is that uh, the uh, Iranian migrants are much more, they are much higher because they came earlier. So exactly what Maria also talked about, uh, how long it takes time to integrate. And you can see that the Iranian, they are almost fully integrated because they came quite early, while the most recent ones coming from Eritrea and Somalia and the Syrians now after the war, you can see that they are much lower and much more to the, to the left than to the right. So things have changed, but not so, so much as we have um, uh, wished to, but still you can see a lot of change. This was equality, which of course is very important with when we talk about women taking part in the, in the labor force. But there are other factors that is also very important, and one that really builds people's um, ability to emancipate, that's trust. And we can see that the level of trust increases among uh, these uh, studied groups, the non-European migrants on coming to Sweden. So they go from pretty low um, levels with patriarchal values and social norms into increased trust values. Trust not only in general, trust not only in the, the in-group, in the family, but also trust in other people, trust in people you don't know, people of another, another religion, etc. So, but you can see that you don't have the same um, more positive expression as you had on equality. People are much more uh, hesitant when it comes to this part. So uh, we have a development, but we need to do a lot more to, in order to 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 be able to to do that. So let me go to then the 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 next one. Um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking fast, but but the time is running, <laughs> so I have to do that. So now we come to choice, and choice is the really big problem, as you can see on this map. It's all it's totally empty. There's no development uh, when it comes to changing values around family, family issues, the ones I, I mentioned, like like abortion, homosexuality, whom to marry when, etc., uh, or, or divorce. You see, they are still in the same um, arena like they were in the country of origin. It has changed very little. And this is the explanation and the conclusion we have when it comes to, how, to, to what hinders, what stops um, taking part in, in the labor market. It is the family values because they keep the women at home. But not only people themselves, it's also our systems. When we give people uh, a lot of money for each uh, child, we give them even more. It's progressive. But also the other factors that Maria pointed out, we can see it on the face-to-face -face level. And we can see how the persistent these values are when it comes to, to, to this. So uh, my, my last slide, uh, my last slide here is then showing 
uh, what I believe is absolutely necessary for us to uh, to do now. This is um, a summing up of uh, all the four sub-indices that I just showed you. And when you put them all together, and these are the new cultural map for 2020, it's uh, uh, just being made now when we are working still with these migrant groups, we can see that the influence or the choice, the previous uh, uh, map that you saw, is very strong. But so it kind of controls. So the, the outcome of the equality and the trust, even if we have a good, uh, relatively good development there, um, it, it uh, collides into to this thing where, where you can see that these, uh, these family values are so strong, so they take out uh, the result. You get a negative result even where you have a positive development on values. People want in to, 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 to come out on the labor market, but with the sy systematic effects of parental leave that are generous or, and also for, for, for other f factors that we have in our societies, kind of counter indicates, counter work with, with what we need to do. So trust is higher than in our country of origin. Um, the conclusion is that we need to focus on these family values and we need to reorganize the way we are giving uh, uh, people support when it comes to, 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 to childbearing and, and these things. So this is a very exact result when it comes to pre best practice and what kind of interventions that we, uh, that we need to, uh, to do. And that is uh, obvious when it comes to, to, to uh, how it stops, hinders effectively uh, people's possi possibility of, or, or wanting to, to, to be a part of the, of the labor market. Um, so that's basically the conclusion so far. The uh, next step for us now is to both work with this in an, a compar comparative migrant well value survey in all the Nordic countries, which we do hope we can do. It's absolutely necessary because we need to learn from each other when it comes to this. But we also work with interventions on in the in the factories, in the different offices, to, to, to see what is happening and by interviewing them. We have made some hundred interviews, long interviews, I mean, a couple of hours and coming back to them to get the way the line of reasoning around this. So these are the, oh, there it's, my time went out. <laughs> I checked myself. So I've done my, my minutes and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. We put on and many really interesting slides you had there, and I can remind all of the all of you participants that uh, you will get these slides if you don't already have have, have got them. You will get them after this uh, webinar, so you don't have to remember everything or write. Everything and may I down. may I say ju just one thing, okay. and that is, you can please take contact with me if you have interests in this. Um, uh, forthcoming study with comparison with the Nordic countries. So please, we are at the Institute for Future Studies, so please take contact, don't hesitate. Yes, do do that. B. Uh, Puranen was, uh, was that. And last, but absolutely not least, it's an honor for me to introduce our next speaker today. Alexandra Riddarstad is the head of Jobsprånget at Swedish Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences. Alexandra is going to speak about Jobsprånget or Job Leap as it uh, can be translated to English and why Job Leap is uh, a successful model to speed up the introduction to the Swedish labor market. Please, Alexandra, go ahead. Uh, and first, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm so happy to speak on this very important topic. And I will share with you some of our results, best practices, especially focusing on female newcomer academics. So um, as uh, you've heard, I'm from the uh, Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. And I'm head of Jobsprånget, which is, which is a part of the academy. And what is Jobsprånget? Um, Jobleap, as it means in Swedish. It's a four-month internship program. And uh, we actually run two internship programs. Uh, one we started back in 2013. And when we saw the great migration crisis coming up, we wanted to contribute. But we didn't really know how. Then some employers participating in our other program asked us 
Can you form a new program for a new target group that we are interested in uh, with the same uh, simplicity? So uh, that was actually the base that we founded Jobsprong it on. Uh, we founded it on the experiences and the knowledge we have uh, from our other internship program. We used the same uh, matching and application portal, but we added a new target group, newcomer academics. And uh, the aim uh, was back in 2016, and it still is, to speed up the introduction to the Swedish labor market. And doing that within uh, the uh, intern's area of expertise. And I will get back to that. And this is Nelidita, and I would like to introduce her. This is one of our interns. In her home country, she worked within HR, and she came to Sweden. She, she applied to so many jobs. Uh, she had a hard time not speaking Swedish with no, um, uh, net, uh, no professional network. And uh, she got in contact with Jobsprånget. And via us, she could work within her area of expertise at, uh, within HR at uh, Evry. And, uh, so she, and that is very crucial for Jobsprånget you do your internship within your area of expertise. An engineer works or do the internship as an engineer, and so on. And um, today it takes about five to ten years for a newcomer academic to enter the Swedish market, a bit lower, um, and uh, even longer within your area of expertise, and even longer if you're a woman. And this is what we wanted to challenge. So it's a four-month internship program, and our target group consists of engineers, architects, natural scientists, and economists. And as I said, uh, it's extremely important for us that you do it within your area of expertise. And what do we mean by speeding up? Well, first, we have an easy-to-use uh, easy application and matching portal where the employer and the candidate meet. Secondly, uh, the language is English, and this was very challenging for some organizations and authorities when we started, because they thought we said Swedish is not important for integration. We don't mean that at all, uh, on the opposite. But you can actually start an internship in English. Uh, and then, so we say, you work in English, you take a fika, coffee in Swedish, and then we now know that after a couple of months, you do your internship in Swedish and you take your fika in Swedish. Today we actually know from um, uh, today we know from the results that you increase your language learning curve while working. But that uh, we didn't know in Sweden in uh, 2016. But this is important. You do it in English. And then third, um, the internship validates the skills. And it's the same time, same thing. Back in, back in 2016, you had to wait so many months, maybe sometimes over years, to get your skills validated. And we said, no, you can do your internship and let's uh, make uh, the internship validate the skills. And actually, the employers, they are experts at this. This is what we're doing every day. Um, and uh, what we now see also that we tell the employers, maybe they uh, want to hire some 10 candidates for their internship position, and we say you need to at least interview one of them, because if you see a person in real life, it's a lot easier to validate uh, your skills in a fair way, and also to deal with the prejudices, uh, and they are often uh, unconscious. And um, we have some uh, 7,700 within our target group, and as you can see here, they're fairly young, there were former asylum seekers, a majority of them from Syria, Iran, and so on. 50% uh, men and women. And since start, we've had 5,500 applicants. And um, we are, uh, we had, uh, we've been offered 750 internship positions since we started. And as a positive result of the internship, we saw something fantastic. Seven out of ten are offered uh, an internship after four months. So as I said earlier, five to ten years to get a job uh, for a newcomer academic. Here we talk about four months and 70% are offered a job. 
And uh, six out of 10 are women. And I will get back to that because it's been increasing. And here you can also see our finances. It's the uh, um, Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation and Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. And we are so grateful for our founders. And what we do is that we simplify the entire process for the employer. And this is a true key to success. So we have our easy to use uh, portal where the uh, employers find their candidates and can uh, call them for an interview. We have national collaborations with the unions and also with the Swedish Employment uh, Authority. And everyone in our target group are part of the Swedish Employment uh, Agency. Um, and we also offer mentor support and a program for the whole four month period. So this is extremely important. Make it easy for the employer because otherwise they won't have time even though they'd like to participate. And as you can see here, we have some 150 participating employers all over Sweden. And we have private, uh, public and large and small corporations. And I'm talking fast because I'm also running out of time soon. And this is Nadidita. So what happened to her? Well, a few months into her internship, she was offered a job within Evry. And she's working with their uh, trainee recruitment. And they see her as a, a real uh, resource uh, and a real, uh, they're still taking in um, interns within uh, Jobsbronge. So they're really happy with working with us. And as you can see here, uh, we've seen an increase for female, both applicants and participants. And why is that? Well, to begin with, we always uh, work with inclusive communication to get a gender balance, both uh, from gender, but also nationalities. So this is an example how we use, how we work in our website. And here you can see storytelling. Don't underestimate the value of storytelling. Women inspires women and men. Women inspires uh, female academic women, uh, female academic newcomers inspires uh, female non-academic new, uh, newcomers. And here you can see uh, three uh, women at, um, and they, we have some digital videos where we interview them and they tell us their experiences. And this is also some quotes that we use in our digital campaign. Um, so just our conclusion, and as we heard from both P and, uh, P and um, Maria, um, Newcomers are not a homogeneous group. In Sweden, we tend to call everyone a newcomer as it is a group. But as we heard, uh, academic and non-academic can differ. Women uh, or men can differ. So in our case, we talk about uh, newcomer academic. Uh, and, and, and also, an academic is very international. When we started, a lot of people told us, because we had, didn't have any experience in the newcomers, that we, uh, the employers would have such a hassle with all the uh, different cultures. That is not true at all. An academic is very international, and the, the hassle, that's the Swedish system, not the culture. Uh, internship is a very easy way, both for candidates and employers, to get to know each other and to deal with prejudices from both parties. But it must be easier to join. And then also uh, communication. Make sure that you communicate directly to women. I mean, it's good to have some intermediaries, but maybe they have the prejudices that you want to counter. So that's a good advice. And also always inclusive communication, as I said. Uh, use storytelling. Women inspires women. And then uh, last but not least, employers in Sweden, they are very interested in diversity, in theory at least. So help them and present different things, gender and background, as with Medivita part of a solution. And um, this is my last picture, and I want to thank you. I hope I, hope I could uh, inspire some of you to uh, share our thoughts. And to exclude uh, female newcomer academics, it's a huge waste of talent. And if we can have 60%, anyone can have. And remember that they lead the way, and they are role models for others, women as well as men. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra from Jobsprånget. Very, very interesting and okay. good, good points. Okay, folks and participants, that was the official part of this uh, webinar. We have heard all of our four excellent speakers, and I hope 
that you have got some new ideas and some new thoughts. At least I have. We will soon turn off uh, the recorder, but we will continue with uh, our discussion and with your questions. So feel free to continue watching and following us. But to those of you leaving now, I want to thank you for taking part in this webinar. And please, you see a couple of questions here on the, on the screen. Please answer them to make us and to help us to improve organizing virtual events in the, in the, in the future. Last but not least, take care and stay healthy.